Hi, my name is Tobias Carlson, and I'm an AI programmer at Sony Ben Studio. And today I'm going to talk about scored coordination in Days Gone with a focus on combat. First of all, what is Days Gone? Well, for those of you not familiar with the game, Days Gone is an open world game set in a post apocalyptic world where a virus outbreak has turned the majority of the world's population into these rabid creatures called freakers that just attack anyone on sight. As a natural consequence of this, uh, civilization has collapsed, and the few survivors have fled the cities and fractured into various factions that are all hostile to each other. In the game, we follow Deacon St. John, a veteran and a biker, and his best friend Boozer, as they're trying to survive this hostile world, while at the same time deal with their emotional scars. Days Gone is currently available on the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5 platform, as well as on the PC. So we are mostly famous for our freakers, or rather our hordes of freakers. However, this talk is not about our freakers, instead it is about our human AIs, and we got plenty of human AIs in our game, and they end up fighting both each other and the player and the various freakers and wildlife. So that means we will have uh, groups of AI uh, fighting together in combat. And as with any human endeavor, when a group of humans come together and try to achieve a shared goal, they will strive to cooperate and coordinate their actions. So if we want to make our AI look believable, then our AI need to be able to cooperate effectively. Also, it's much more difficult to fight an enemy that is coordinated, uh, that attacks uh, in unison, rather than attacking piecemeal one by one. So this is a much better way to improving our AI's difficulty than, say, increasing hit points or hit accuracy. The thing is, though, coordination is hard. And coordination is particularly hard in an open world game, as anyone who has tried to write AI coordination is probably well aware of. The thing is, uh, in our open world game, our enemy can come from any direction at any time. And we don't even know what kind of enemy might be coming. So this makes it difficult, if not impossible, to script uh, for any possible scenario. And what we need to come up with is a more systemic approach, which in our case means AI for group coordination. And our solution, we feel, is a comparatively simple solution, yet very powerful, which allowed us to solve all the problems that we came across. And we also think that it is a solution that should be easily transferable to many different kinds of games that face the same kind of problems. So the things we need to solve is First of all, uh, the group needs to figure out a goal that the group is trying to achieve. And then on a group level, the group needs to exhibit the behavior that furthers that goal. Uh, individual group members uh, will be playing roles within that uh, group behavior that uh, will further these uh, behavior. And these roles need to be assigned to the right character or the right group member at the right time. We also need to deal with positioning, both relative to the enemy, relative to our friends within the squad, and uh, also appropriate for the role. And finally, we also need to deal with timing. So if we have a group member who is assigned to provide covering fire for another group member so that other group member can do his thing, then that's no good if that group member jumps out of cover, empties uh, his gun and then dives back down to reload just in time for that uh, the group member that he is covering for to be ready to actually make his move. So for the rest of this talk, I will use these blue circles to symbolize the squad uh, whose perspective I'm talking from. And uh, these red circles will be the enemies of our blue circles. So when we started working on Days Gone and the human AIs in Days Gone, we started working on individual AIs and their behaviors. So we made sure that the AIs could uh, fire their guns and actually hit their targets, reload those guns when they were out of ammo, 
uh, get around the level and get into cover when need be. And this kind of looked good if we were spawned in a single AI in a level and fought that AI. The AI knew what to do and was a reasonably good opponent. But as soon as we added uh, more AIs, particularly if we had two groups of AIs that were enemies of each other, things didn't look as good anymore. And the obvious reason for that was that we had no coordination. So the biggest problem was combat was very difficult to read without coordination. And what we would have would be that our two sides would uh, intermingle with each other. So we would just have a mix of enemies trying to attack each other. And this was something that was exasperated by the relatively short distances that firefights in Days Gone uh, happen at. Uh, firefights in Days Gone are very up. Uh, uh, close and personal, even with our longer range weapons. And one thing that also happened here was that because Dayscon is a cover shooter, uh, any AI that is in cover needs to have a cover that is valid. And with valid, we mean that that cover provides cover against all enemies. So if there's an enemy that's in a position that uh, the current cover is not valid for, well, that AI will have to move and get to a new cover. So what we would see is that when these the, our AI just got mixed up like this, at least one of these AI's covers would invariably be invalidated, and that would force that AI to move. And as that AI moved, well, that AI would invalidate at least another AI's cover, and what we would end up with was these cascading cover validations where each AI uh, would just get uh, cover and validated over and over again, and the whole group would just be milling around. So obviously, if you want to be in a firefight and be an effective uh, uh, combatant, you want to be shooting at the enemy. And when you're moving to a new cover, you're not shooting at the enemy. And even worse, when you're moving, uh, you're not in cover, so you get very exposed and our AIs turned out to be very ineffective uh, opponents when put in groups without coordination. On top of that, uh, our combat kind of lacked direction. It was hard for us to tell whether uh, what, what was going on. Like, are the blue uh, enemy uh, attacking from the top or the red ones coming from the bottom left here? Uh, if you weren't there for the beginning of the uh, combat, it was unclear what exactly uh, they were fighting about. On top of that, our AIs weren't red and blue circles. Instead, they kind of looked like this. So they were mostly in green, grays, and brown. And they were in an environment that was predom predominantly green, gray, and brown. So instead of having this, we had something more akin to this. And it was impossible to just look at what was going on at a glance and see who was fighting who. So the first thing we realized we needed to do was to separate the two sides. And as soon as we did that, it became very obvious uh, where, uh, what was going on. Here we see that the blues are on the left and the reds are on the right. There might be environmental clues that will uh, help us understand if the blues are defending or the reds are uh, attacking or not. And also, when we turn our guys all back to green, it's still fairly easy to distinguish the two sides from each other. And on top of that, this uh, separated sides also give the player more tactical options. Because now there's a front here between the two sides, and each side has a flank or two flanks and a rear. And that means if the player happens upon this altercation in the world and decides to support one uh, side over the other, the player can now attack his enemy in the rear or decide to shore up uh, a weak flank and decide uh, the player is supporting. So we needed to start organizing. And in our games, we organize our AIs into something called squads, which is just our name of our groups. And all AIs are organized in a squad. So when an AI spawns, we create a squad for that AI and put that AI on that squad. Now, obviously, having a squad with just one AI in isn't all that interesting. There's not a whole lot of cooperation that's going to happen. So what we do is that if 
two squads get close to each other, or so that we have two members of the squads, one from each squad that are within a certain distance. Well, then these squads will merge together. And now there are one squad, and they will operate and cooperate as one. So for instance, when we spawn our AIs, they tend to be uh, spawned next to each other. So any AI on the same team will naturally uh, merge into a single squad. Similarly, if uh, squads break up, we also split up the squads into one, uh, two or more squads. And this means that we don't need to figure out which AIs are going to be cooperating with, uh, with other AIs. We know that because we have this automatic system, two AIs on the same team that are close enough to each other, they will always cooperate. And while two AIs as that are too far away from each other to effectively be cooperating will not. So squads in days gone are full AI entities, which means that they run our equivalent of a brain and they run actual behaviors. The squad's behaviors are primarily concerned with assigning roles to the individual squad members. And examples of roles is providing cover fire, uh, being a grenadier, or flying the enemy. Individual AI's res uh, responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the squad is to perform those roles to the best of their ability. So roles in Days Gone are self-contained behaviors that are added to predetermined slots in the AI's behavior hierarchy. This has a number of benefits. First of all, because the roles are self-contained, that means that if we want to write a new role, we don't need to touch any of the existing roles. Also, because we put the role in the AI's behavior hierarchy, that means that there are roles, that, uh, behaviors that AI has that are higher priority than the role. So, for instance, if uh, the AI is get attacked by a grenade, the AI has a behavior for trying to avoid that grenade. And because that one will have higher priority than roles, that means that no roles actually need to deal with the problem being attacked by a grenade. Also, we uh, have uh, other behaviors that just have lower priority than the role, and these roles will never, uh, these behaviors will never be performed as long as we have a valid role assigned to us. We also need to understand the tactical situation, and for that, we have something called the front line. The front line defines the uh, spatial relationship between the squad and its enemies, and it consists of a direction of combat a width of the front, a neutral area, and an area controlled by the enemy. So to calculate the direction of combat, we find the center gravity of our squad. And this is simply just the average position of our squad members. And then we find the center gravity of our enemies, and the uh, directional company, uh, the directional combat is simply the direction between those two points. Next, we have to figure out the width of the front. And this is uh, either the width that the enemy is presenting to us. So if the enemy is spread out, well, then our front line is going to be wide so that we can spread out and meet the enemy. Or a minimum width if the enemy is not that spread out, which is defined as the width that the score would have if it's lined up abreast along the front line with a a specific distance between them each other. Now we we do this to make sure that uh, there's enough room behind the front line for a squad to uh, be able to fight effectively, because the squad is not allowed to move outside the width of the front line. As for the neutral area, the front line can be operated either in a close or a far mode. In a close mode the neutral area extends a fixed distance from the nearest enemy. So this means that the neutral area will move with the enemy and the squad uh, is not allowed to enter the neutral area, which means that if the uh, enemy is pushing in on the squad, well, that would push the squad backwards. But if the, squad moves if the enemy moves away from the squad, well, then the uh, squad can follow the enemy. In far mode, which is uh, used a lot uh, less frequently. The uh, neutral area extends all the way to the closest squad member. 
And we use this in uh, special scenarios when we want the scroll to stay in place. For instance, if the scroll wants to uh, is set to carve a particular uh, like object or a place or something like that. And because the neutral area extends all the way to the scroll, it doesn't uh, matter how far away the enemy moves, the score is not allowed to enter the neutral area, so it will stay in place and continue guarding whatever it's guarding. And the enemy control area is simply the area that contains the enemy, plus a little bit of an additional depth behind. And the reason we add this additional depth is that, as we'll see later with flanking, it's good to have a little bit of depth to the enemy control area, because particularly if we were just fighting a single enemy, the enemy control area would otherwise have nearly no depth. On the other side of the front line, that space is divided into lanes, and we have one lane for each squad member. And each squad member is assigned a lane in such a way as to minimize overall uh, movement. And the reason we have the uh, lanes is to ensure that all the squad members are appropriately spread out along the front line and don't get into each other's way, and particularly the each other's line of fire. So when uh, a squad member is assigned a lane, that squad member will attempt to perform its role inside that lane if at all possible. Now, it's worth noting that lane assignment is not just a one-off, because as the front line moves around, what is the optimal lane assignment can change, particularly if the uh, front line rotates. This can change the optimal lane assignment quite dr drastically, even with small rotations. But we also need some motivation for our squads. And for that, we have something we call confidence. And confidence is a measure of how confident the AI is that it will uh, win its current encounter. So a confident AI thinks that it's likely on the winning side, while an unconfident AI suspects it's betting on the wrong horse. Confidence is a major factor in decision-making, both for individual AIs that have several behaviors that are fully or in part driven by confidence, but also for the squad, which in combat is almost exclusively driven by confidence. Squads, however, do not have uh, a confidence value of their own. Instead, instead, they use the average confidence of the squad members rounded towards neutral. Uh, our confidence is not an analog value. Instead, we use discrete levels. And we do this because it's much easier for the player to read distinct state changes rather than a subtle increase or decrease in a particular behavior. Our confidence levels are heroic, which is super confident, the AI don't think anything will touch it. Confident, the AI thinks it's on the winning side. Neutral, we don't really know how things are going. Worried, we're definitely not probably not winning this and panicked, which is, I'm out of here. So to calculate an AI's confidence, we calculate the total uh, strength of each side. And when I say side, I, uh, I uh, mean, for the friendly side, it's the squad members and any other friendly uh, units that are fighting on the squad side. And for the enemy side, similarly, all the perceived enemies that we are aware of. And when we calculate the total strength, what we do is we sum up all the individual strengths of each uh, enemy or each friendly that we found. And then we take the quotient between the friendly and the enemy side and compare that to threshold values to get our actual confidence level. So the way we calculate confidence or the strength of a single character is that uh, we first get a starting strength. And this starting strength is dependent on both the faction of the character whose strength we're calculating, but uh, also the strength of uh, the faction of the character viewing this faction. So we have something looking like this, a matrix of how various factions view each other. So for instance, we have certain factions like our militia faction, that everyone kind of agree that they are uh, stronger than your average uh, uh, enemy and uh, they are hence well-respected. 
We also have uh, something like our crazy uh, cultist faction called the Rippers, who think they are just superior to everyone. And we all know those kind of people. And hence, they think that everybody else's starting strength is uh, pretty low. Normally, though, most uh, factions kind of agree on which faction is the stronger, which one is the weaker. But we can have situations where both factions think the other one is superior, which will cause them both to have lower confidence and be more uh, careful in combat. Or perhaps we could have uh, two sides that think the other side is inferior, which will make them more aggressive and more confident fighting each other. So once we have the starting strength, we modify the strength with various multipliers. The most important multipliers is what kind of weapon the AI is carrying. So for instance, a machine gun is much scarier than a pistol. If the AI is armored or not, the health of the AI, and here again, we have a distinct level, so we only check if the AI is severely wounded or not. And finally, the confidence of the AI. So a confident AI will lift up its squad's confidence, while an unconfident AI will bring its squad down. And panicked AI here has a specific uh, uh, effect and is a special case. So if you're fighting an enemy squad and you see one of the squad members just freak out and run off, we want that squad to be close to breaking. And in order to emphasize that, we add a panicked AI strength, not to the friendly side, but to the enemy side. We also add the strength of casualties, so not just the strength of the living, to the total strength. And uh, the reason we do that is if we have a squad that managed to deal out a disproportionate number of casualties to the enemies, we want that squad to become uh, extra confident and extra aggressive. And likewise, if uh, your side is taking an unnecessarily or unreasonable number of casualties, that will negatively affect your confidence. Casualties is something that degrade over time. And this is a time scale that is much longer than your typical combat encounter. And the reason we do this is to make sure that if the player follows a squad for an extended period of time, well, that that score isn't permanently elated or permanently depressed for something that happened way back then, maybe even before the players started following that score. So it turns out that confidence is a good predictor of outcome in our game. A confident AI is very likely to be on the winning side, and an unconfident AI is very likely to be losing. And this is great. This, this is just a... Um, uh, like a receipt that what we're doing with confidence is what uh, we want to. It, it's working. But when it comes to the player, we want something more because we, uh, we want to use confidence in a way to encourage the player to play with a certain play style. And the way this works is uh, a confident AI, as we will see, will become more aggressive while an unconfident AI becomes more passive. So if we're noticing that the player is not really uh, engaging with the AI, instead trying to hide behind a cover far away and take pot shots, well, then we start increasing the confidence of the AI and, uh, in order to make the AI more aggressive and force the player to do something else. Well, if the player is himself being uh, aggressive and doing flanking and invalidating cover, uh, going to melee and just using all the tools available to the player, well, then we start decreasing the confidence of the AI, well, we, which will make the AI a little bit less uh, aggressive and this will give the player a better chance of pulling these behaviors off and hopefully make the player more likely to try this in the future. So now that we have uh, both the confidence to tell us how we're feeling about things and the front line to tell us all about how things are looking for us where everyone are, well, it's ready to, we're ready to create some behaviors. So in combat, the squad can either be forming up and in normal combat, retreating or pushing the attack. 
forming help happens when uh, one or more squad members are out of position. And this is either uh, the squad member is too far forward, so the squad member is in the neutral area or maybe even the enemy control area, too far to the side, so the squad member is outside the width of the front line, or too far behind, so the front the squad member is outside uh, its weapon's effective uh, range. When this happens, any squad member that's already in position will just hold that position and engage the enemy to try to keep the enemy occupied. Uh, AIs that are far away from the front line and the enemy will just run in a straight line towards the front line to try and get into position. However, if we are close enough to the enemy that that is not safe, the AI will instead move from cover to cover uh, until it makes it back to uh, a good position. Once everyone is there, we are ready to go back to normal combat. So during normal combat, which happens when confidence is neutral, we're focusing on the basics. So we're trying to maintain good spacing within the squad, which is what the lanes are there for. We make sure we have a clear direction of combat, which is what the front line uh, gives us. And we also make sure that our sides are well separated which is what the neutral area is there to do. And this creates a very good looking and interesting dynamic combat because as the uh, squad and the enemy moves, the front line will uh, move and rotate with that and that will uh, cause the uh, squad uh, to counter any enemy moves, uh, which uh, look quite uh, impressive when you look at it. However, if the AI's confidence is low, the AI will go uh, try to retreat. And when retreating, the best direction to retreat in is obviously the away from the enemy. And that happens to be the exact opposite of the direction of combat in the front line. So when we're retreating, we select half of the squad members to retreat. And we prioritize those squad members that have no cover, but otherwise we take those squad members that are the closest to the front line. Uh, any AI that is not selected to uh, retreat will provide cover fire for the retreating AIs. The retreating AIs only move a short distance uh, back because when you're retreating, you're at your most vulnerable because you have to turn your back on your enemy. And then this behavior repeats. And the interesting thing is that because the uh, AIs that were closest to your front line now move back uh, in the next uh, iteration of the retreating, the AIs that were providing cover and fire will probably be the ones retreating, while the ones that retreated previously now provides cover fire. So what we get is two groups of AIs that are changing uh, up with, uh, between retreating and providing cover and fire, which creates a very nice looking leapfrogging effect. The score will continue to retreat until either it's blocked, it managed to break contact with the enemy, or forever, for whatever reason, it managed to uh, regain its confidence. If the uh, squad has high confidence, on the other hand, the AI will go on the defensive and, uh, offensive and try to press the attack. First thing the AI will do is try to move closer to the enemy. And this is a behavior that is very similar to retreat behavior, only it goes in reverse. So the AIs that are first for the front line are selected to move forward, while the remaining AIs will provide cover fire. And we continue doing this until the squad gets close enough to the enemy, at which point we will try to flank the enemy. And flankers are picked uh, among the squad members as those that are already in a good flanking position, which means that they are either on the extreme left or right of uh, the front line. So when we're uh, flanking, the flanker will try and find a position in an area perpendicular to the enemy control area. And this is where it really comes in handy to have a little bit more depth to the enemy control area. And the reason for that is that the squad member has more opportunities to find a good position uh, to uh, attack from in here. And also, if you're a little bit behind the enemy, that makes for a better flanking position than if you're perfectly in alignment with them. As some of you may have realized by now, the quality of frontline is really key to our 
the quality of our behavior. So if our front line is bad, then so is our behavior. Uh, particularly, the front line determines if an AI's position is valid. So repeated small changes in the front line can cause the AI's uh, position to be invalidated over and over again. And obviously, this causes the same kind of problem that we talked about before, moving instead of shooting. And also, it makes the AI look very indecisive, which, generally speaking, is uh, does not make for a good-looking AI. So what we realized was that there are a number of things that caused the front line to move when it didn't need to. So we spent a fair bit of effort finding and addressing a lot of these. One of the first things we realized was that certain AI archetypes just did not play very well with the front line. The first such one was our snipers, who, uh, uh, as the name implies, are snipers and want to engage their enemy at extreme distances. And they live in these little areas called sniper nests that they are not allowed to leave. So if they would be part of a squad, then because the, uh, the sniper can't move with the squad, the squad's center of gravity would be pulled towards the sniper all the time, and the squad would not be able to properly move with this enemy. And hence, we just don't add snipers to our squads. On the other extreme, we have uh, some an archetype we call rushes. And the rushes are armed with uh, shotguns that have very short range or melee weapons. So their tactics is to run straight about up to the enemy and attack at really close distance. Obviously, this means that they run straight through the neutral area and well into the enemy controlled area. And this would uh, cause problems with our frontline calculations, both for friendly and enemy rushes. And again, we just ignore them and don't add them to the frontline calculation. And the, fr the squad doesn't need to deal with rushes specifically anyway, because we have high priority behaviors that uh, will kick in if a rusher gets really close to an AI. Uh, Days Gone is, as I mentioned, a cover shooter, which means that almost all our combat happens in or around cover. And the way AI uses cover in Days Gone is that we have something called a cover slot, which gives the position where the AI is supposed to go in order to use the cover, and it also has some additional information on the details of how to use that cover. But when the AI gets to the cover slot, its position doesn't stay right on top of the slot. There's a number of behaviors and animations that cause it, the AI, uh, AI to move. For instance, our reload animation has the AI take a step back away from its cover to make sure that its weapon doesn't intersect with the cover when it's playing the reload animation. And uh, even more extreme, uh, when attacking an enemy from cover, particularly high cover, the AI may need to step out of that cover in order to get a clear line of sight to the enemy. And this movement can be as far as two meters. So the AI is moving around while in cover caused a lot of jitter in the uh, front line. And what we realized was that it didn't really matter exactly where the AI was as long as it was using a cover slot. So what we ended up doing was using the, uh, the position of the AI's cover slot rather than the AI whenever the AI was in cover. And this uh, had settled down the front line quite a bit. We also calculate the front line as a sliding window average. So that means that its position and direction is calculated as the average in a certain time window. And this moves out uh, the movement of the front line and leaves us with the general trend while removing a lot of noise. But using the average over time makes the AI kind of slow to react to big changes. Uh, so what we do is that if um, uh, the uh, change becomes significant, then they are adopted at a higher rate than small changes. And if the change is large enough, well, then we just take that new position and rotation and start working from there. And this is to deal with situations where we might be fighting a uh, small group of enemies over here, and then a massive enemy force show up from the other side, and we need to pivot uh, to deal with them. 
Flankers are great. That's one of the coolest behaviors the AI does in combat, but they also cause a bit of problem. So if we were to have uh, flankers and treat them as normal members of the squad during combat, that would uh, be an issue because as the flanker flanks, uh, uh, the uh, center of gravity would have to move with the flanker. And when the center of gravity moves, that means that the front line moves. And as you can see in this example, uh, when the front flank moves like this, the flanker is no longer in a valid flanking position. And even worse, the two AIs that stayed behind to support that flanker's flanking move are now out of position, and this squad would have to uh, go back to forming up. So fortunately for us, identifying friendly flankers is easy. That's just the people that the squad has told to be a flanker and who has per started performing the flanking role. So we don't need to add them to the center of gravity. However, if we do that, that also comes with a bit of a problem. So again, if the flanker flanks and the flanker no longer uh, uh, contributes to the center of gravity, well, the center of gravity is gonna move again, which will cause the front line to move. And again, the flanker's position is now invalid. Admittedly, this is not quite as bad as the previous example, but it's still not good. So what we do is that a flanker on the flank leaves a ghost behind in the front line. Now, the ghost is uh, just the position the flanker had before the flanker started flanking. So whenever we now need to calculate the squad's uh, position and center of gravity, we use the ghost position rather than that of the flanker, and this greatly stabilized the front line. Uh, that ghost is removed if the front line moves far enough, and this is because the ghost cannot move, it's just a position. And the whole point of adding the ghost is to stabilize the front line when the flanker flanks, and if the front line needs to move, well, then there's no point in trying to stabilize the front line because if it needs to move, it should move. The ghost is also removed if uh, the uh, flanker rejoins the uh, front line, uh, that is, it's no longer a flanker, or for the flanker is no longer part of the squad for whatever reason. Enemy flankers are a lot more complicated. And the reason for this is that our front line may not necessarily uh, be the opposite of the enemy's uh, front line. So we may not have a, a mirror image front line. First of all, we might be fighting multiple enemy squads, in which case their front lines will look very different from our front line. Or the enemy might be uh, fighting our squad and another friendly squad. So uh, then in that case, the enemy's front line will be different. And also there's nothing guaranteeing that there's only two sides involved in a particular encounter. There may be three or more factions battling it out at the same time. And finally, the flanker or the potential flanker could be the player, and the player doesn't have a score that lets the player know whether the player is assigned a flanking role or not. So the way we deal with enemy flankers and enemy center of gravity calculation is a little bit more complicated compared to the friendly ones. So first, we identify all clusters of enemies. And this is just a simple clustering algorithm that uh, runs on distances. And once we have these uh, clusters, we find the largest such cluster, and then add any cluster that's within a given fraction of the size of that largest cluster. This allows us to calculate a tentative front line, and then we can add any cluster that is covered by that front line, uh, to, uh, which then allows us to calculate the final uh, front line. This may leave us with one, one or more clusters that not covered by the front line, and these are our flankers. So uh, we, uh, we like flanking, as I said, but the technical, tactically sound option for a squad that is being flanked is to try to do something about it. You should really not just stay being flanked, but that wouldn't be fun because that would mean that the flanking would 
pretty much just fail because the enemy would move every time. So what we do is we let the flanker uh, flank us for a given amount of time. So whenever we see a flanker, then we give the flanker a timestamp. And uh, uh, as long as that timestamp hasn't expired, we let the flanker be. But as soon as it uh, expires, then the uh, flanker is put back on the uh, center gravity calculation and with the rest of the enemies. And this will cause the front line to move. And that will cause, uh, in turn, the score to move and deal with the uh, flanker. And if that flanker wants to continue flanking us, well, that flanker will have to make another flanking move. Now, another thing we noticed was that the player uh, that is able to move a lot more than a simple AI. And part of that is that the AI doesn't have to wait for all its friends to be ready and in position to make a move like AI's in the squad. But also, the player has this sprinting ability that makes the player the, by far, fastest human in the entire game. And we would see the player run in wide circles around the AI, which was caused the AI to perpetually having to rearrange uh, itself to meet the player's new position. And we did a lot of work on trying to make the AI be faster at repositioning, but all the things that we did were simply just not enough. There was not even close. And what we eventually realized was that when the uh, player is running uh, fast like this, the player has no chance of hitting anything with its gun. But the AI, on the other hand, doesn't have a, a big problem hitting moving targets. So what we do is that when we identify that the player is starting to move at a very high speed, the AI just waits for the player to settle down. And the player will settle down sooner or later, or rather sooner than later, because the AI will start building accuracy on the player relatively quickly, and the player will be forced to get into cover or close into melee distance. And when that happens, that gives us a little bit of a pause that allows the AI to rearrange themselves and meet the player at the player's new position. Now, so far, the um, uh, front line uh, that we use is only looking at the enemy's position relative to our own position, but it doesn't have any environmental information. And the thing is, environmental information and environmental analysis is uh, quite a lot of work, and we're a bit lazy. So we realized that we were very fortunate that we knew some people who had an intimate knowledge of the environment in which the AI was going to operate in, and that's our level designers. So our level designers can provide context uh, and identify features and defensive opportunities within our levels by adding uh, some, a number of markups. The most important ones of these are our defense zones, um, our home areas, and our fortification zones. Defense zones are large areas in which the AI operates, and you can kind of think of them as the AI's uh, sort of territory. Each squad is bound to its defense zone with a given strength, and all but the strongest binding strength allows the AI to temporarily leave its defense zone. And the reason why we uh, want the AI to be able to leave the defense zone is that if you have arbitrary invisible lines in the world, that has a tendency to create weird behavioral artifacts. And on the team, we call that the mime in a box problem. So uh, the way we ensure that the AI doesn't just permanently want us off from the defense zone is that we use confidence. So a confidence score is allowed to press the attack and go outside of its defense zone if the enemy moves outside the defense zone. As the squad leaves the defense zone, it starts accruing a uh, confidence penalty. And as uh, the squad moves further out, that uh, squad's confidence will eventually drop to the point of neutral, which will force the uh, squad to stop. And the squad will then hold its position, and eventually the squad's uh, confidence will drop even further, and that will cause the squad to move back to its defense zone. 
Once back in its defense zone, the uh, score will slowly re recover its confidence. And the reason why we uh, do this slowly rather than immediately recover the confidence is that if the score's real confidence was, say, confident, and we immediately gave back its full confidence when it came back in the defense zone, the score would immediately leave again, and we don't want that kind of flip-flopping behavior. Uh, the home area uh, can be used in conjunction with the defense zone or on its own. And this is a much smaller uh, area that marks up where the AI is anchored. So this could be the AI's base or camp or maybe a resource is guarding. And when a score is assigned to a home area, a number of things happen. First of all, the score will always retreat towards its home area. And once it reaches the home area, it will never retreat any further. So effectively, it makes a last stand inside its home area. And uh, when, uh, if an enemy managed to get in between the squad and its home area, the squad gets really upset and is allowed to press its attack, even in neutral. So I said that the squad always retreats to the home area. But if we take two arbitrary points in the world, representing two central gravities for a squad or enemy, and with the corresponding uh, front line, it's very unlikely that the retreat direction will be towards the home area. So the way we deal with this is that we bias the uh, it's called center of gravity towards the home area's position. And the closer the score gets to the home area, the stronger the home area's influence is until if the score gets close enough, the home area's position completely overrides that of the score's center of gravity. And Regardless of how far away the squad is from the home area, we ensure that the front line is never rotated 90 degrees or more. And that way, always when the squad retreats, it will get closer to the home area. So the squad also needs to take advantage of uh, strong points and short points and other good defensive opportunities. And for that, our level design is placed fortification zones. A fortification zone consists of an area to fight from and a kill zone in which we're going to attack. So the area to fight from is where we're defending from and the kill zone is where our enemy is coming. And it's worth noting that the kill zone is at Frustum uh, because uh, generally speaking, if you're defending from position, you will be defending in like a Frustum in front of you and that the kill zone isn't necessarily attached to the area to fight from. And for instance, this is useful uh, for if you're on an elevated position and defending the ground below, well, then you want the kill zone down below rather than up uh, where your uh, area to fight from is. And also, if you're in a fortification and your enemy managed to get right up to that fortification, that probably means that your fortification is about to be overrun and uh, you should have abandoned it a little bit earlier. So the way the kill zone worked, or the fortification zone worked, is that uh, normally it doesn't really do much for the AI, but if the AI's target moves into the kill zone, then the fortification zone becomes active. And as soon as that happens, the AI will move into the area to fight from and attack the enemy from there. So the way this all comes together is if we look at this example AI stronghold. So the A, this is a good stronghold because it is surrounded by a bunch of natural obstacles. It has this nice little house in the middle that the AI can uh, uh, sleep in and be safe from the elements. It has two entrances that the AI will have to guard against intrusion. And of course, since we're a cover fighter, there's plenty of cover around. Uh, first, we place a defense zone, and you can see that the defense zone is covering the entire stronghold, and that it is an irregular shape. Also, the defense zone extends outside the entrances for a bit, and this is to allow us to be able to engage someone who's just hiding around the corner. We also had a home area, and we put that in the house. So this is what the, uh, the AI is really concerned about, and this is what it feels safe. 
And finally, we identify a couple of uh, good defensive opportunities and add some fortification zones there. So if an AI or an enemy uh, were to attack from the south, well, first I would go into the kill zone of this fortification zone, which would activate this fortification zone. Now, most fortification zones have a limit to how many AIs can be and fight in that fortification zone, and this is generally just based on the size of the area to fight from. So any AI that's assigned to a fortification zone that uh, the fortification zone can accommodate will immediately move to the area to fight from when the enemy comes in here. Remaining AIs uh, will be fighting as a squad using cover and the front line just like normal. If the enemy manages to push through the, the uh, kill zone, well, then the AIs assigned to the kill zone or the fortification zone will uh, leave that fortification zone because it's no longer valid and rejoin the rest of the squad and fight like normal. As the enemy pushes further in, the squad will be retreating towards the home area. And if the enemy pushes the squad all the way back, the squad will get into that house and make a last stand there. Now, this solution worked really well for us, but it's worth noting that the front line is inherently two-dimensional. Uh, it works on a slope, so you can uh, pitch it and twist, uh, rotate it, but you can't twist it or turn it. So a worst case scenario would be fighting on a spiral staircase. Fortunately for us, there are very few of those in our game. We also have special behaviors for fighting in and around buildings. And the reason for that is that Frontline doesn't, does quite a good a job to describe what's important in a constri constrained space and where you want to be. In those scenarios, it's much more important to look at openings between the different rooms, that is, uh, windows and doors. And for that, we have special uh, behaviors for fighting from room to room, from inside a building against enemies that are outside, and also if we're outside a building and try to fight our way inside a building. The front line is also uh, not really good at fighting uh, animals and uh, freakers. It's primarily there for our human opponents that are uh, ranged opponents. But even when fighting uh, the wildlife and the freakers, the front line gives us a good start to organize and uh, position our squad, even if other high priority behaviors will take over when uh, those enemies close into melee distance. Finally, it's kind of interesting to note that the player sort of intuitively respects the front line. The player may not know exactly where the neutral area is or what the width of the front line is, but when the AI is well lined up along the front line, it becomes, becomes obvious to the player that this is the area where the AI is in control. And uh, this is over here that I am, so I shouldn't get too close if I'm in uh, range combat. And uh, they kind of fight like our AIs in many ways. And this is all I have on this topic. Uh, I would like to thank the rest of the Dayscons AI team who contribute a lot of the behavior uh, for our AI, as well as to the people at Ben Studio who helped me prepare this uh, presentation. Speaking of Ben Studio, Ben is a great place to live and uh, Ben Studio is a great place to work. We're always looking for uh, new talent and uh, you should check out, uh, us out at our homepage to see if uh, there's something there for you. So uh, I will be in the live Q&A session after this talk finished dreaming. Thank you all for watching and have a great rest of your GDC.